Hey everybody, so over the last several weeks, this is Scott by the way, but I think you know that because you're on my channel. If you didn't know that, then you're probably lost. Well, welcome anyway. So over the last several weeks, I've actually had quite a few people come up and ask me about the rad pad situation. And uh, it kind of turns out that I've really not talked about um, the whole thing at all. Um, over the last few years, because uh, about two and a half years ago, some of my viewers came to me and um, exposed that they had been um, attempted to have been defrauded by the RadPad people, and um, uh, they they felt that um, they had kind of a connection to him, and, and, and they thought he wasn't really trying to defraud them. Clearly, he was. It was absolutely terrible. Um, tried to really try to from them. Um, incredibly upset, but. In, um, uh, in deference to the things that I wouldn't, I wouldn't expose his business fraud uh, publicly and just, just to work with people privately if anyone asked me about it, and I didn't get involved. Um, I was warned um, by, by legal sources uh, to make sure not to do anything with RadPad um, in fear of uh, legal repercussions because they were well known uh, in the country uh, as being a scam and I've had so many people approach me over the years so like yeah Radpad is the poster child for scams in Nicaragua like they they are they are the name like if you want to say you know what are Nicaragua scams like just go ooh Radpad and everybody knows what you're talking about so they've they've got a reputation that is extreme now I've never directly dealt with them um, everything I know is from uh, from my viewers, but they brought me like the prospectus. They brought me the paperwork, right? Now, the reason we're talking about it now is twofold. One, a lot of people have come to me and asked about this. And two, the company uh, took off, right? They've changed all their stuff to make it look like they were never in Nicaragua. This is kind of a reminder that this is a company that was all in on Nicaragua, made a big thing about Nicaragua, and now is not here at all. They don't exist. Um, so, so if you go to their website, they now claim to be a Costa Rica company, and, and they're running the same business in in Costa Rica. So sorry for the Costa Ricans. Hopefully they look through the material and go, oh, wait, this is so obvious what's going on. But um, so I knew about RadPad as being um, not legitimate in any way. Uh, and when I saw the prospectus, all the things that they told me, everything, first of all, standard con, um, befriended them in a bar, claimed to be a really good friend, said he wouldn't trust anyone else with this. It was a special opportunity, guaranteed profits, no way they could lose money, brilliant idea, blah, blah, blah. And then every single thing he laid out for them was an uh, absolute lie, false information everywhere. And he was doing it, of course, in San Juan del Sur, because that's where you catch people when they're fresh off the boat. They just arrived, they're on their first day of vacation, everything's wonderful, and they have no clue what is is the value of things they have no idea what's realistic and they have no idea that they just walked into a giant pyramid scheme um and that all the locals know to watch out for anyone in san juan del sur not that there aren't legitimate businesses but the chances of being defrauded are very high you just got to be really really careful when you're down there and uh so it's it's the place to grab people when they're when they're new so uh shortly after that time the rad pad YouTube channel started, and uh, I saw the first video and then never watched it again because it's a train wreck, right? But, so, um, it, it, a number of people recently have been like, well, they disappeared. What happened? And then some people who are not that close to the situation, a lot of people who are outside Nicaragua are like, well, we've been watching this and had no idea that it wasn't realistic. Because, of course, exactly the things we warn about in real estate things, right? That people will lie about the value of houses. They'll make all this fake information to get you to be fooled. And this is a perfect example of how wildly inaccurate information was given to convince you you needed to do something that doesn't make any sense. So they made this video introducing RadPad, which I can't believe has not been deleted yet. Um, and uh, I went back and watched it because I knew that it had a bunch, when it was the only video that existed, I knew it was full of misinformation. Everyone knew that was here. And, uh, but a lot of people haven't like seen it and dug into it. And if you're not from Nicaragua, you don't realize. So I'm going to, I'm gonna link it below. Um, a couple of his videos that uh, very clearly exposed the scams. He, he was very sloppy. He let the cat out of the bag a few times. We believe that he made a video. Um, we did talk about it. it was, this is how it kind of became public. It was sent to me and someone on my channel realized that he had admitted to a bunch of criminal activity, it seems like, um, and asked me to go through this because he was recommending criminal activity to viewers. 
and teaching them and, and like a lot of hatred towards Nicaragua, like hatred, like, like trying to encourage um, hurting Nicaragua as a country and hurting individual people. So um, really wanted to, uh, at that point, I couldn't stay silent, right? So we made a video. We didn't link to him. We didn't say it was RadPad, um, but we, we went through his video and, and went through all the things that were illegal, all the things that were unethical, the places where he lied about how businesses work and stuff, like claiming that employees bear all the risks of investment and that, you know, uh, North American business owners should carry no risk. That's for the poor people. And that, like, really extremely horrible things. Um, and that there's, I have no pity after that video, none. Um, but, but that was it. He left the country almost immediately after that. Um, and I assume simply because he made a video that publicly, uh, appears, uh, from my view, it appears to have admitted and bragged about, uh, employment fraud, uh, theft, business fraud, and tax fraud. Um, things that generally will get you run out of a country. So uh, whether he left because he suddenly just didn't like it anymore or whether the video got some attention or whatever, I don't know. But if I was him and realized I had made that video, I would certainly want to get out of any country I was in um, just because you only have so much time before they realize what you've admitted to. And, uh, you know, you're always going to be in fear that someone downloaded a copy of that video and could produce it in a court. So um, bragging about committing crimes, generally not something you want to do, especially if those crimes include defrauding people who are very, very poor and destitute. Um, okay, so but the original video that he made is full of misinformation and should be enough for people to realize there was a scam. But of course, if you don't know Nicaragua, you know nothing about it, you don't realize all these things. So I'm going to break this down. This is why it's not a daily. This is a special episode that I did, but, but literally person after person over the last like two months. Um, a lot of them have come up on my live stream, so we have talked about it a bit there, but I want a place that we can point to. So when people are, I don't, so I don't want to have to go through this each time fresh, right? So these are kind of the events. And, and remember, I'm very at arm's length. Like I watched the first video, I'm like, this is 100% scam. There is nothing valid about this. Every word that comes out is a lie. So let's just go from there. But I'm going to break down his first video. It was only six minutes long. Feel free, free to watch it. And you can follow along with my notes about how basically each sentence has something dishonest in it. So starting from the very beginning, he says, um, he, he's going to tell you everything he knows about RadPad at the beginning, as if it's a thing he discovered and not a business he was trying to start. And, and this gives like a really weird uh, preface to this, right? So that's super weird just from the beginning. Um, he then immediately says it's a solution for lowering risks, which we're going to show that is the exact polar opposite of what it is. It's specifically a thing to meant to increase your risk so you can get more money from you. At 40 seconds, he says, don't make a large investment, but then immediately tells you to make an enormous investment that makes no sense. The whole premise here is very misleading. At 50 seconds, he says, buy a landless module home to discover Nicaragua and see what it's like to live here. He immediately throws in with, the way to discover Nicaragua is to do something so completely insane. This really, we have to dig into a little bit. So he says to start your Nicaraguan discovery, not by staying in hotels, not by renting temporarily, but by buying land immediately and then investing in something before you know what it costs. Of course, that's his goal. And then see what it's like to live there after you've already invested. A lot, presumably. That's a really dangerous thing to do. That's the very opposite of taking your time to discover something. He's, he's really pushing people to do something very, very reckless. At one minute, uh, he suggests, again, that the red pad is a low-cost investment. But we're going to get into this again. But it's 500% or higher than normal Nicaraguan investments of the same thing. It's not low-cost by any stretch of the imagination. It's extremely high-cost. That is a really important piece of this puzzle. At 112, uh, he says that you should, he recommends that you spend time, that you buy land and put this extremely expensive uh, module home, it's more like a shed, there's no like home aspect to it, onto your property and live there for a while. I don't know how you live there. The place is not, as far as I can tell, large enough to live in or plumbed or anything of the sort. And so basically move into what would account to basically be a $1,000 Costco shed. Literally, you can buy those here for $1,000 and have them up in, in about an hour. 
Uh, and, and of course, they're not quite as stable as this, but this doesn't really exist, so it's hard to say, right? The Costco one is real, and you can have it delivered same day, uh, and it is about $1,000, and it's definitely large enough to live in, and it already has electric. Just plug it in wherever it goes, add an air conditioner if you want, and it's completely livable, and it costs next to nothing, and you can have it the same day. Uh, so <clears throat> his idea here is, at, at one minute and four seconds, is that you should go out and buy a property which he's pro also, we're going to get to, promoting really high-cost areas. Every, absolutely everything he's doing is promoting wasting as much money as possible. So he suggests that you go out and buy a piece of property, twenty, fifty, hundred thousand dollars $100,000, whatever, put this $40,000 pod onto it, and live there for a while. So you just spent $140,000, which anyone who lives in Nicaragua should, alarm bells should be going off. These aren't realistic numbers for anything in Nicaragua, but we'll get to that. And live there for a while to decide if the enormous investment that you've already made was a good one or not. I'm not exactly sure what his game plan is there. Just, oh, you decide that wasn't a good one? Then you should buy another piece of land somewhere else, buy another modular home, home shed thing, put that there, and try it again. That's really crazy. Um, hopefully, at this point, everyone has tuned out from him. At a minute and 12 seconds, he basically says, live there. Spend way more money than you probably should spend to be in Nicaragua in the first place, and then decide if you're going to build another home. Do all of this with the idea that it's not even the place you want. This is just a very temporary, extremely expensive way to find out if you want to actually invest. It's hard to describe just how bad of an idea that is, if you were to do it at all. At 1 minute and 37 seconds, he makes the claim that the financial investment is so much lower than a traditional home. This is where we really need to get into real numbers. So the thing that he's proposing is getting a lot of land, right? Which could be very cheap. Let's say it's $1,000, but realistically, he's pushing ones that are twenty dollars to $100,000. But let's just say he got one for $1,000. And then put a $40,000 shed on top of it for you to try out living on. That's $41,000 as a starting point. Anyone who's lived in Nicaragua and put any amount of time looking into what actual housing cost, an actual home, two bedroom, one bath, extremely minimal, nothing special, but that would outperform this as a property. That's important, right? Yes, it's a very minimal home, but it's an actual livable home with a living room, a kitchen, two bedrooms, a bath, and the land to put it on in a gated community or in a gated-like community, it depends where you are. Generally, all over Nicaragua starts at $16,000. That includes the land. So $16,000 is our number. And if we were to look at this, this would have to pretty significantly beat that because you can build those, I would say, in about a week. Um, they are built all over the country with great speed, great reliability. The materials are very cheap, hence why it is as cheap as it is. It's very easy to do anywhere. Um, and it's and you can have any number of builders do it. You have protection. If you don't like the builder, you can move on to another. It's a standard structure you can sell to people because everybody knows the structure. The plans work. It's tried and true. And it's a full, livable home. Extremely basic, but it's not a shed. And it's not waiting months for maybe something specialty that is untested you've never seen to be delivered. Like the degree between $16,000 for a really nice standard home and $41,000 for a theoretical crazy shed. How you can claim that shed is a low-cost investment, I don't know. But that's there's no way to honestly say those words. right? But it depends on people not realizing that Two-bedroom houses start at $16,000 all over the country, brand new, and you can move into them the same day. Um, and getting into a, a really nice, large three-bedroom, I mean large by Nicaraguan standards, not large by American standards, obviously, but a really nice three-bedroom with a big living room is about $32,000, again, with the land included, right? So even the biggest standard homes in Nicaragua aren't going to come up to the price of the shed without land that he's proposing as a deal. So that's a super misleading thing. It depends on people not knowing what prices are realistic for better structures, for standard structures, and claiming this is a somehow a discount. And the people that I spoke to fell for this. They thought that standard homes must cost $100,000 like they do in the US and didn't realize that this would cost more. Of course, they don't necessarily cost that in the US. I know people who've bought their homes, six bedrooms for $35,000, right? Depends where you are and you know what you want. 
uh, at a minute and 44 seconds. He makes the speed claims. He says that uh, it takes often years uh, to build a home, which uh, theoretically a house could take years to build, but normally that's because of the uh, the, the people not having the financing, uh, wanting something specialty that's really a problem. Um, under normal circumstances, houses are built relatively quickly. Um, most Nicaraguan houses are going to go up in a matter of weeks. Of course, if you're uh, an expat and you're having something really specialty um, done, it can take as long as it is that you want to have specialty things done, right? So yes, his claim that it could take years is not completely unfounded, but the idea that it needs to, and that you wouldn't be able to live in the house during that time, that you need something to watch over it, like it's not very well based in reality. He acts like there's no way to get, he actually said he doesn't feel there's anywhere to get below one year, and basically no one in the country actually waits a year. That is less than 1% of people would hit a year. Most would be lucky to hit a few months. So houses go up very quickly in general in Nicaragua. Um, even relatively large ones. Uh, I've seen a house get built down the street from me. A massive mansion went up, and I would say they probably built the whole thing in two to three months just to give, and probably bigger than almost anything in the region he's talking about. Certainly bigger than anything that someone who's going to buy a rad pad would build. Uh, he says at 1 minute and 55 seconds that you can get a rad pad in about six weeks. This is quite a claim to make given that he didn't have it designed, built, or any idea of what it would actually take. What I've heard is that in theory they take three to four months now. Um, that's what they're telling people for when they order. That's a, a pretty far cry from six weeks and completely defeats the purpose given that even at six weeks you could get a traditional Nicaraguan full home built anywhere in the country probably faster than six weeks, but now that it's more like 12 to 20 weeks, um, just the numbers don't make sense at all. The thing you're actually going to be waiting for is your modular home. At 1 minute 57 seconds, he refers to them as livable structures. In his mock-ups, because there isn't a real one, they are anything but livable structures. They are simply a shed. Uh, there's just four walls, right? There's nothing to them. Uh, in theory, you could add walls, but there's so little space, I don't know how you would do that. We get a little bit of time then at 2 minute and 49 seconds. He says that they're going to film behind the scenes and show every step of the way, getting residency, how schools are, business licenses, everything it takes uh, to move to Nicaragua, start a business, and become RadPad. I've been through his videos, and to the best of my knowledge, there is not one piece of information about any of this. This was a completely false claim. Uh, it seems at this point. Maybe someone can find something that qualifies in some way as suggestive of this, but I found nothing. And having paid attention to the channel for a number of years, I'm unaware of any information ever coming from the channel. It, it came into a mixture of just random videos about nothing in particular mixed with occasional uh, sales pitches for other products because they were trying to make money somehow, I assume. At 3 minutes and 34 seconds, he claims, uh, this is Tony, the, the, the founder, uh, makes a claim that uh, he will be, you know, he's using these things in all these ways and, and you will watch through this channel and, and learn from him all the ways that the RadPad can be used and sold and invested in how you can invest and, and make all this money. Of course, the whole point of this is pitching to get you as an investor. Um, there is, I definitely know, not a single video uh, of all of his videos ever uh, that shows the RadPad at all. I've never seen one that shows the rad pad, at least not until he moves to Costa Rica, and then there's a new, whole new rad pad, and in theory there is one that an investor uh, put up to assist with making it look like they're actually making them. Uh, are they actually making them? I can't say. In Costa Rica, I don't know at all. I just know that in Nicaragua, uh, there's no example one that we know of. I do know some are standing. I've been told those are built where a uh, investor who is uh, looped in was convinced to build some to make it look like they were actually building them when they were actually internal demos and not actually in use. That's what I've been told. Uh, and that was, I didn't even find out about those until after they had left uh, the country and the business was gone. Um, but he made this big point of he's using him, he's demonstrating, he's running Airbnbs and all these things. Of course, none of that ever happened. There's no videos about it and there's no Airbnbs that you can go look, there's no structures to go look at. So that was completely false. So the, the degree of false at this point is, is really extreme. <clears throat> Uh, at 3 minutes and 53 seconds, he makes a point. It lowers risk, but it doesn't lower risk. It creates risk. There's nothing that it does that's useful. If you needed to live on site, you would want to have a mobile trailer, rent something nearby. There's no reason to expend $40,000 plus 
to wait a really long time, possibly long enough that your house could have been done, to have this thing plopped in front of it, be an eyesore and in the way. Um, you could have just built another house. You could have rented the house next door. You could have lived in a trailer. You could have just driven over. Like, as a uh, uh, builder, as an investor or a uh, advisor to building a house, the first thing you'd say is absolutely do not let this get in your way and use your financial resources. Um, this is such a giant portion of your potential nest egg being burned to both delay you and tap your resources, all for something that gives no benefit, none at all. Uh, uh, at four minutes, he claims that construction would be two hundred to three thousand, two two hundred to three hundred thousand uh, dollars, which of course is plausible to build a house that's that expensive. Um, remember that we're not including the cost of the land, not including the cost of the rad pad. This is the house that you expect the rad pad to oversee. So let's start with the rad pad is nearly fifty thousand dollars by the time you actually make it livable. If you could even make one livable, if you could do it for fifty thousand dollars, those aren't seen. Forty thousand is to have a shed, is my understanding. So that at a two hundred thousand dollar house is twenty five percent of your total cost of the house above. Imagine spending two hundred and fifty thousand dollars to build a two hundred thousand dollar house with an eyesore sitting in front of it that delayed you by four months. That would make you pretty angry and would define foolish investment. Even if it was a $300,000 and it only took the six weeks that he said, still absolutely insane. Financially, anyone who's building a house in this price range, one, is building outrageously above standard market in Nicaragua. There's no normal house that would ever be constructed at this price uh, without the land included. Um, but anyone doing putting in $45,000, $50,000 for, for a small modular shed to be forced to live in, which would be absolutely terrible, right? Living, imagine living in a shed for presumably two years is the theory here, while you oversee the, the construction of uh, a $300,000 home. The, just saying those numbers should make people just steam come out of your ears that he would dare say this to someone, right? The, the idea is so absurd. If you're building a $40 million home, oh, of course, dropping $50,000 if it somehow aided in watching over the project would be a no-brainer. But when you're talking about so much money that it would be essentially impossible for the house to have an overrun equivalent to the financial disaster you're guaranteeing by throwing $50,000 away for no reason at the very start of your project. It would also flag you as incredibly gullible and up for any number of other scams. But, and the construction crew would never have any faith in you, obviously. Everything's wrong here. And of course, most people building a house, most, the vast majority, would be building at a fraction of this cost. And in most of the country, a tiny fraction of this cost. In many cases, less than the, the cost of the rad pad itself. For the cost of the rad pad, it wants, if you don't have to pay for the land, you can put in a really nice, uh, good size custom, larger than standardly available Nicaraguan home. Now, of course, most, most expats are going to be living in the area he's talking about. Want something more than that, so that is very low for that. But the numbers he's giving for standard construction are not the standard numbers. They exist. They're extremely, extremely high end, but he's not approaching people who are in this zone either, right? Though people who can afford these things are definitely not watching these videos and are not falling for his investment scams. At four minutes, 28 seconds, uh, he claims that he has already put together all the right people, but never ever in all the years that he had his videos did these people put anything together or do anything. At four minutes and 53 seconds, he claims that the most important thing, the thing that he wants is transparency. But already by this point in the video, he's not at all transparent that he made up all these numbers and none of these are based on Nicaragua. Transparency is exactly the thing that he wasn't and the thing we're upset about. At five minutes, he basically says that truth is what you decide it is and he can say what he wants. That pretty much explains his worldview and the problems we have here. At uh, five minutes and 10 seconds, he professes his love for Nicaragua but uh, he doesn't live in Nicaragua. He lives in Costa Rica. And all of his business about Nicaragua says Costa Rica now. And this entire thing doesn't exist. Even, the, you know, even as a potential future business does not exist in Nicaragua. The website only says Costa Rica. They left lock, stock, and barrel, it seems. So this seems, well, things change. But it feels a little bit disingenuous when you combine it with all the other things that 
at no point does it feel like any of this project actually started. It's easy to say, well, any business can fail, and that's legitimate, but most businesses don't start with uh, investment pitches that are totally dishonest and uh, full of misinformation that you don't disclose to the public where people can point out and say, obviously, all of this is false. Anyone investing in this should have had an advisor that said, obviously, everything is being based on is dishonest. Therefore, you shouldn't be in business with someone that initiated the, the relationship through dishonesty. At the end, he gives three important bullet points, the things he wished he had done differently when he came to Nicaragua, and I don't think very much of this list, but let's go through it. At 522, he says the, the one car that is absolutely right for Nicaragua is the Toyota Hilux. Now, a Hilux is a very popular vehicle here. It is a very expensive vehicle here. It is a mark of affluence in the country. A lot of people decide to drive them because it is a showy car, much like driving a sports car in the United States. It is, unlike a sports car, relatively practical, but it depends what you're doing. If you're going to live in uh, like a very small percentage of the population in coastal Rivas and San Juan del Sur, then it is, in some cases, a pretty practical car. Uh, it definitely falls into a reasonable car category, but the Hilux is, for the average person, not the right car. It just isn't. We'd all like one if we had unlimited money and it was at least one of our vehicles, sure. It's nice to have a pickup, but... Normal people do not need to have a truck bed, and uh, most people, even those living in Nicaragua, don't need off-road vehicles. That's not the norm. I know we all say, well, there's this road that's bad here and that road that's bad here, but the average person doesn't even need a car, let alone a pickup truck that is specifically designed for rough roads. That is the exception, not the rule. Now, if you live at Playa Tesoro, yeah, Hilux is a great choice. Although, if you're on the roads like that, quite often you want an old beater car. He was also very specific that he recommends you only buy brand new and only from the dealers in Managua, which is not a terrible recommendation. But if you're in a position where you need a pickup truck, it is pretty common that you don't want a new one necessarily because you're going to be pretty abusive to it. New cars are often a problem in, problem in Nicaragua because they don't stay new very long. Everything gets bumped here and having a new one often makes people very unhappy. Um, it's well within the realm of reason to consider a brand new Toyota Hilux. It is anything but the one car people should have. That's a pretty crazy recommendation, but we'll let that slide. He's not making any money on that, we presume. Here's where it gets truly nutty. At 5 minutes and 35 seconds, this gives some of his complete and utter insanity. He says that his one recommendation, or his second recommendation, I'm sorry, of the, the three things that he wished he had done differently, he says rent for one month in San Juan del Sur. He's very specific. You should only rent for one month and only in San Juan del Sur. He refers to San Juan del Sur as the center of Nicaragua. Now, we're going to bring up a map to show you just how far from the center San Juan del Sur is. In fact, of all population centers in Nicaragua, San Juan del Sur is generally described as the point farthest from the center. It is, by very definition, the absolute non-center of Nicaragua. But in his worldview, we can project he is viewing and mistaking Nicaragua as a very, very tiny place that is just a small community around San Juan del Sur. And when you watch his videos and go through a lot of his stuff, it does kind of give a hint that in many cases he does actually not have any familiarity with Nicaragua, which could easily be the case. He gives that vibe of someone who's been in an expat enclave, has no idea where he is, doesn't know that his context makes no sense, and assumes other people are also totally without knowledge of and context of Nicaragua and are totally lost. Otherwise, this statement makes no sense. Even just a casual backpacker who just happened to glance on a map, cross the border from Costa Rica, and here this would go, wait a second, I'm pretty sure San Juan del Sur is right on the Costa Rican border and on the coast, and Nicaragua is a really big, almost square country. How can the bottom left corner be the center? That makes no sense. And how can a little tiny village as I said the municipality is about 15,000 and a half people, but as uh, Danilo Oscar Blanda Martinez has pointed out a few times, the actual village is only about 7,000 people. Now, I'm cherry-picking to say that the small number is the one we're going to use here when normally I use the large one, so we're not going to go with that. We're going to say 15,000 people, but this is a country of 7 million. To say that a remote 15,000-person rural community on the very corner, not just edge, but corner of that nation 
is the center is insanely disingenuous. He's really making a point to try to build a picture of a very expensive, very exclusive Nicaragua and in other things is trying to use Nicaragua as this big context and in here is trying to do the opposite. Um, he then recommends that after just one month of renting in this one very specific out of the way place, don't have any, don't learn about Nicaragua, don't go out and do it, buy land immediately. So it's exactly the thing we've been warning about everyone, everywhere for years. Take your time. Rent for years. Get to know the whole country. Learn what real estate is worth. Figure out where you want to be. Don't get sucked into any individual community. Leon, Managua, San Juan del Sur, doesn't matter. It's a big country. If you're coming to the United States, imagine getting a recommendation that the only place you should look at is Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Nope rent for just a few weeks, and then buy, but only within driving distance, a casual driving distance in your pickup truck of, of Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Oh, nope, New York? Nope, ignore that. California? No, 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 ignore that. Florida? Never heard of it, right? Focus on one small community. Think of nothing else. It's kind of what it's like. That would be absolutely crazy if you were to say that about a small community in the United States and be like, ignore the other 340 million people and all the things that the rest of the world sees as the United States. Just focus on this one really different place. And that's important. San Juan del Sur is not indicative of Nicaragua. It's anti-indicative. That doesn't make it bad. San Juan del Sur has got a lot of amazing stuff. It's a pretty cool place. But it's certainly not indicative. And spending one month only renting in that place and only looking right around it, isolating to just one month, my gosh, I put in three months the first time I set foot in Nicaragua, and that wasn't even beginning to be enough time to do research. I put in this much time casually over again and over again, all kinds of different places. Like, this is such a tiny amount of time. This is not even settled in to figure out which grocery store you like yet, let alone knowing which city in the country you want to build in, let alone what community within that city. The, the order of magnitude of insanity that this is. This is so absolutely by the book. He might as well be a real estate agent saying, whatever you do, don't research, don't look behind the curtain, buy before you get here. We don't want you to have any idea what's going on. And then at six minutes and two seconds, of course, he slips in his third recommendation. Oh, the thing he wished he did was put a casita on the land before building the house. I'm pretty sure he never built a house. I don't think he had a place to live. He wouldn't have just run out of the country the way that he did had he owned a house or land or anything else. Seems unlikely. I'm just guessing, but it seems unlikely. But of course he says that, which of course then he's going to say, well, my casitas, these little sheds, are better than a real casita. A real casita, of course, would cost less and be nicer. Um, but that's a crazy thing. Unless you want a casita on your land. If you want a casita, which many people do, then it's absolutely fantastic. But you certainly don't want... A rad pad, you want a beautiful Nicaraguan casita that are all over the country, very common and uh, well accepted. Like even here at my house, I have a two bedroom, one bath casita um, that, is, that is part of our house. When we talk about our room count, it's part of that, right? We don't, we don't separate it out, but it is a separate building. It is a casita. So it's a two bedroom, one bath casita, and then the rest of the house is a seven bedroom. And that casita, if you were to go build it, it certainly wouldn't cost $16,000. My guess is it would be a lot closer to $9,000. Um, and maybe less. It could be more like $6,000. But that's a realistic number to what it would cost to build a small casita that would be larger than and nicer than a rad pad. Uh, and, and is realistic, and we have, right? And, and Nicaraguans all over the country already have. So it's a standard thing. And we also have a bodega that is about the same size as a rad pad. Um, that was, is far more comparable to it because it's not plumbed the way a rad pad is not plumbed. And that I think to build is about two to $3,000 absolute max. A lot of that goes into the foundation and roof. The walls really do very little. Uh, so those are some comparables, right? And then when you're starting to talk about $40,000 in waiting months, instead of being able to build it more or less over a weekend, probably about a week in real reality, um, it all just doesn't make any sense. So I know that's pretty boring. Um, but I wanted to give, for the people who are interested in this, a way to dig in and say, oh my gosh, every couple sentences was something obviously misleading or dishonest or non-factual or just a sales pitch or whatever through this video. And then you can take this and say, wait, these are the things he promised. And then look through this huge YouTube channel that they created. And none of it reflects this. None of this. Like at some point they keep showing the factory, but they never show a rat pad, just the factory, right? Now, maybe I missed something, but I've been through a lot of videos and hunted through and it just, 
Nothing. And everyone I've talked to, yeah, that's that's what it is. There never was one. When there finally was one, it was right at the last before they left the country, and it was not a customer. They never sold one, ever, right? That is my understanding. Not a single one has ever sold in Nicaragua. There are some built, but they were right at the last second, and they were built by RadPad to make it look like there were customers, and it was presented as if customers had built it or had ordered it, uh, but they had not. And uh, to the best of my knowledge, they are unused, as you would expect, because who would want to use that? Someone told me that there is one in Costa Rica and that it's actually on Airbnb and that they filmed some stuff in it. That may be true. That is after all of this. It's too late for it. Now that he's left Nicaragua, he is locked in time that all of this was without doubt. There's no way to say this was not a scam. Obviously, all of it was a scam. And the worst part was all of this, the goal wasn't to sell them, right? The goal was to sell the investment in his company, which when we looked at the investment prospectus, made it sound like it was going to be an investment and you would make money. But when you actually read it, the legal portion made it very clear that the money was going to be a gift to him. And there was no ownership. There was no profits. It was 100%. If you decided to fall for his scam and he was able to present this as a great business opportunity that was going to make him rich, he uh, he would leave out why he needed additional investors if he had all of these pieces that he claimed. He claimed he had the business working. He claimed he had all the pieces and in, in, in parts together. He had all the people in place. Yet, for some reason, he claimed he needed more money, which didn't make any sense because he claimed it was done. What would the additional money be for? Uh, but when you read the paperwork, he... He was very clear, oh, he's looking for investors, and then the paperwork was simply worded to give him the money personally. It was basically like telling someone to make out a check to cash and being like, no, no, it's going to pay your bills, but you're just going to go take the cash and disappear. There's nothing that ties them to the money after they've given it to him. Uh, so that was that's what the real scam was, right? Of course, all these things are scams, and if someone was tricked into buying one, they'd probably have built it, and that would have added to the overall scam that they were trying to run. But the actual scam was trying to to enlist secret investors to invest into his business and then help promote this, what is basically um, a Ponzi scheme that never took off. So that's that's my reading of this. And now that the, the business is gone and never succeeded, um, we can safely say it's true. Unfortunately, um, I wasn't able to go public with this until it's after the fact. But for those of you who are wondering and want to be able to put it all together, that is the chain of events. And what we understand is what has happened. And if uh, my anticipation is that they're going to delete a whole bunch of the, the YouTube channel once they have enough new content, uh, because it definitely is incriminating. And if you were someone in Costa Rica looking at this, you would immediately go, oh my gosh, I need to call the police because clearly there's something awry here. So um, you know, maybe I'm wrong. Um, that'd be great if uh, Tony wanted to pop in and be like, no, we're still operating in Nicaragua. We have an operating factory. We're actually selling them. You can come visit and see it all in place and, and see where it's working and see real customers who aren't looped in investors who are trapped and trying to, to make it look like a real thing. But uh, uh you know, uh, it seems unlikely, but absolutely, if Tony wants to come up here to, to Leon or wants me to meet him in San Juan del Sur and, and show off the factory and, and show us all the stuff that's going on in Nicaragua that just there's no website for and we don't know about, we'll, we'll happy to, to show up and uh, be proven wrong. So open invitation for that, but make sure that all of the employees have had their taxes paid and they are not owed salaries because uh, we have been warned uh, that uh, you can get in a lot of trouble for, for you know, cowarding with, uh, co is that the right word? <laughs> for uh, uh, presumingly to look friendly with someone who is um, defrauding people. So that has been a direct warning uh, that people need to watch out for that. Uh, but he's not here anymore, so not a problem. Um, but uh, we would need some proof that the bills have been paid after he went public saying that they had not been um, in order to do that. But, Tony, you're absolutely invited to uh, prove us wrong. We'd be happy to see you here in Nicaragua and uh, give us a tour of all the things that are going on. Um, otherwise, um, I, you know, honestly, I think CINSA has a lot of questions that we all have for them as to their involvement in this, because they were advertised pretty heavily. Um, I'd really like to find out that since it was taking some legal action to distance themselves from the situation, because there's been a lot of advertising, and I've heard from people that they have seen Sinsa involved in this, which makes me um, a bit wary of what's going on. So thanks, everyone, for joining me. Um, sorry for a boring one, but I, I think it's an important walkthrough. So we'll see you next time.